I'm excited because on this very first weekend of February, we want to honor Black History Month. I love the diversity. Come on, you make some noise. We absolutely love the diversity and the beauty of the community that God has entrusted us with, this incredible community called Hope City. And this month, we not only celebrate the incredible achievements and contributions of our beautiful African-American community, but also the enduring spirit of resilience and determination that continues to inspire us all. So may this month serve as a catalyst for meaningful change and a reminder of the importance of embracing unity and diversity as a reflection of the image of God. Come on one more time, Hope City. Can we honor Black History Month together? I love it. All right, let's pray. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence, to be in a church that looks like heaven, a church that's multicultural, multi-generational, a church, God, that is contending for more of you and less of us. God, give us ears to hear you today. I pray, God, that you give us a mind to understand, and most importantly, a heart ready to receive what you have for us for evidence 2.0. If you receive it, shout amen. amen. Y'all, I love this series so much. I was actually kind of like excited to get through January because this series was such a game changer last year. And we talked last year about how when you walk with the Lord, there should be some sort of evidence. So some of y'all remember it. There should be some sort of evidence. People should be able to tell there's something different about him. There's something different about her. So we're gonna be talking about who we are in Christ, who he has created us to be, and how we are to overflow and live our lives reflecting the fruit of the Spirit. Last weekend, we celebrated with 7,519 of our family and friends for our nine-year anniversary. One more time, make some noise. Nine years. It's a long time. Nine years. And something that the Holy Spirit nudged my heart on was the fruit of the Spirit, how we are to really look into the fruit of the Spirit this year more than ever because there's nine fruit of the Spirit. So this month, we're gonna be walking this out in our Evidence 2.0 series all the way through the end of the month. And we're gonna choose, it's a choice, to grow as a community and learn more about how we are called to be more like Jesus. Last uh, summer, we brought in our summer sessions, we brought a gentleman in named Pastor Stephen Chandler. Y'all remember Pastor Stephen? <laughs> Pastor Stephen said something really prolific last week. He said, it's interesting how society has brainwashed us to the point where we are more concerned about receiving likes and being liked yeah. than looking like Jesus. Yeah. How we're so concerned about receiving likes, needing affirmation. I don't know why they don't like me. Listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help somebody get free today. Stop worrying about not being liked. You don't even like everybody. That's gonna help somebody. I heard a friend of mine the other day, he said, so, so if you have a personal issue with me and you don't like me, then this is what I ask of you. I ask that you would call me on the phone and let's talk about it. The Bible talks about when you have an ought with a brother to call them. He said, but if you don't like me and you do not have my phone number, then you don't know me well enough to not like me. So carry on. I don't know who that was for. I felt... Hey. All right, let me help somebody. Okay, when we walk with Jesus, there is evidence that you've been around him. There's evidence that you've been in his presence. It's like a residue. I, I, I love her. I'll never name names. Sweet, sweet lady in between services. She bear hugged me. She's like, get over here. She's like, got me all up. And I'm telling you, I, I smell just like her perfume. Like, it, there is evidence that she gave me a bear hug. There's evidence when you've been and live your life with Jesus, people should notice a difference in you. They should notice that you are set apart. They should notice that things don't rattle your peace like the world notices and seems rattled at every single thing. But if we allow culture to shift our perspective, what happens is this. We end up miscontextualizing the word and then we start building our own version of how the Bible should fit our life and what Christians should look like based upon how it makes us feel or what others think about us. But when you walk with Jesus, again, something should look different, seem different, should be different in and throughout our lives. When you walk with Jesus, come on, somebody say aloud, when I walk with Jesus. Come on, when we walk with Jesus, when you follow his word as your moral compass to your life. It's like a built-in GPS. We have access to the Holy Spirit that says, no, 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 don't, don't get in that relationship. No, 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 don't step through that door. 
No, no, that door was closed. Why did it close? For your protection. Like sometimes these moments happen in life and we wonder, God, why? And God's like, because I don't want you to wreck yourself. And sometimes God has to mess up our plans so our plans don't mess us up. And so when you follow his word as the moral compass of your life, this is the, this is the good news. Things begin to change for the good. So I've got great news and bad news. Here's the good news. You're growing and it's really uncomfortable. Here's the bad news. You're growing and it's uncomfortable. <laughs> But the good news is you're growing. Come on, elbow the person next to you and say, I'm growing in God. Come on, look at your second choice and say, this message is for you. I feel you came here for this reason. But the truth is, when you walk with the Lord and good begins to be produced in your life and you start walking out the fruit of the Spirit, the things that used to entice you, the things that used to draw you back, the things that used to hold you captive, the things that you used to self-medicate with, you're no longer enticed with it. Because the closer you get to Jesus, you begin to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But the truth is, when you walk with Jesus, there will be conflict. When you walk with Jesus, if you actually look at the disciples' lives, there will be persecution. When you walk with Jesus, to be a Christian literally is to be set apart, to be Christ-like. When you walk with Jesus, there are going to be people who are committed to misunderstanding you. And the truth is, when we walk with Jesus... And we get up every day and say, but I will be intentional about growing a little bit more every day. Our prayer throughout this entire series of Evidence 2.0 is that you would recognize it is worth it because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth and the life and there's the world's way. There's some ideology out there that says this is culture's way of living life and then there's God's way on how we're supposed to live and again, I pray during this series that you would allow him, because it's a choice, John chapter three, verse 30, allow him to increase in your life as you decrease so that you can grow and get stronger every day. Come on, shout out loud, I'm getting stronger. Come on, I feel, I feel the spirit of God on this entire weekend. I love our church. I love this since 2015, which again, last weekend, I've, I've already said it multiple times, we celebrated our anniversary nine years ago, 2015, this amazing church called Hope City uh, released a sound in our city and it has continued on and only gotten stronger. And I love that this is a Holy Spirit, life-filled, Bible-based, Bible-foundational, gospel-preached church. We preach the good news. The gospel literally means good news. And there are so many things in life that are negative and stressful and frustrating and overwhelming and intense. But the more you read the Bible, the more you realize, well, that's really, that's really good news. So this is a really good opportunity for you to shout in a moment because at the very top of Evidence 2.0, week number one, I felt like prophesying some good news over our church. The good news is God loves you. The good news is God's hand is still on your life. The good news is the enemy has been defeated. The good news is God has been faithful to you and faithful to keep protecting you, even in a bad place. Come on, the good news is when you felt weak, God was there. The good news is when you felt empty, he showed up to fill you up. The good news is when you were broken and wounded, yeah, God was there. The good news is when you were in a low place, he reached down with his righteous right hand and plucked you up out of that messy spot. The good news is when you were filled with anxiety and stress, God was there. The good news is when you were discouraged, God was there. The good news is when your friends and your family ran away and walked away from you, God was there. And the really, really, really good news, with all of hell that's happening around you, it's no match for the heaven that's inside of you. Come on, somebody shout out loud, that's good news. It's good news. See, I have... I have postured my family as for me and our house, we're gonna serve the Lord, but we've also postured ourselves in such a way that says our peace is not negotiable. My joy is non-negotiable. Now, I will keep my joy this year. I will keep my peace this year. It is not based upon the White House and the political tensions. It's not based upon the economy or what things look like. It's not based upon diagnoses. No, no, no. I will keep my joy. I will keep my peace. Why? Because I know who stands with me. I know who is strong, and I know who is good, and I know who is faithful. Come on, somebody say, that's good news. So if you've been around Hope City for any amount of time, if you have called Hope City home and we're your pastors, 
there's specific repetition and terminology that we consistently say. And one of the lines that I feel is a bold statement because we believe it is that God created each and every one of us on purpose for a purpose. In Genesis 127, it says it this way, that we were created in the image of our God. You're marked by his presence. God put his unique thumbprint on our lives and on your life and paid very close attention to every intricate detail, even down to the uniqueness of your fingerprints. You are one of a kind. Look at the person next to you and say, you're one of a kind. Unless they're your twin and then you look like them. and be like, well, we still have different, we do have different fingerprints, but... <laughs> It's ridiculous. I felt led to say this. I told my wife, I said, babe, I feel so fired up about this weekend. Like, I could hardly sleep last night. And I just feel like saying this over someone. This is not gonna be for everyone. This is gonna be for the person that it pierces your heart. But you have permission. I need somebody to hear this. You have permission to be the best and the greatest your bloodline has ever seen. I felt so strong about that. I don't care what your lineage and your background was, what we didn't go to church, and that, no, no. You have permission to be the best and the greatest your bloodline has ever seen, and then that's a legacy move. It's passed down to your babies and your baby's babies. If you receive that shout, I received that. That's for me. It's for me. So he's placed gifts, he's placed strength, he's placed purpose in and on each and every one of us. This entire series blesses me because I remember being born. My parents are amazing. Can you give it up for Dave and Barb? They're watching right now. I'm sorry. I said Barb. Barbara. <laughs> She'll fight me later. She'll be like, call me Barb again. Watch what happens. <laughs> fight you in front of your friends. Okay. But I was, I was deemed, some of you know this, but the doctor told my mom, like, hey, you know this baby's an accident. Maybe you should just abort this baby. From the moment of conception, I don't care how you ended up here. You're breathing and standing in the faithfulness of God today, which is proof that he's not done with you yet. I'm proof. I'm living proof. A lot of y'all recognize this. You're living proof of the keeping power of God. So I feel like saying this over somebody. You're not an accident. You're not damaged goods. Your life is not so fragile and flawed that he can't unlock destiny in you. You're not overlooked by the creator. No, instead, he shaped and molded you and knows you by name. You matter to God. Say it out loud until you believe it. I matter to God. And we see in John 10, 10, where the enemy comes, his purpose is to come to steal, kill, and destroy. The problem is we stop there. We're like, oh, man, well, that's bad news. But the good news is the second half of John 10, 10 says that my God, somebody shout my God, because he's a personal God. My God comes to give me life and life more abundantly. And then in the midst of broken moments, in the midst of things that you would deem as disqualified, watch this, God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He sees you, he knows you, there's purpose to be unlocked in you. And I love how the world disqualifies people and we just kind of throw them to the curb and say, nope, nope, you can never be significant again. But Ephesians 2.10 describes us as his masterpiece. God sees value in his creation. So I wanna walk through a handful of people that God used to do great things that we, in our humanity, would consider disqualified misfits. So let me run through this list real quick. I think some of these people you may be able to connect with. Abraham, yeah, he was too old, but God still used him. Elijah was broken and suicidal. God still used him. Joseph, beat up and abused. Yeah, God used him. Job went bankrupt, had lots of money struggles. God still used him. Moses had speech problems and insecurities. In Exodus 3, he has this burning bush moment. Like the voice of God comes out of a fiery bush. And Moses is like, cool, cool, I see your hand moving today. But you sure me? You want to choose me? I've got speech problems and I'm super insecure. I'm about to have a panic attack right now because of this burning bush. And God said, no, no, I have set you apart. You're going to free my people. I'm going to use your life. Gideon was terrified and afraid. Samson, a womanizer. Rahab, a prostitute. The Samaritan woman. Yes, yeah, she had lots of struggles with men. 
Noah, yeah, he was a drunk. Jeremiah, way too young. Jacob was a cheater. Peter denied Christ three times. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus was money hungry. Paul persecuted Christians before becoming one. I need somebody to grab this today. Do not believe the lie that you're ever too disqualified because there's mercy for every mistake, grace for every goof up. God still sees you. God knows you. And I'm telling you, God chose you. He chose you. Now, every day is numbered. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. That's why often throughout the month of January, I said, you don't have to know all the details. You don't even know, have to know his plan because you know his promise. He has incredible plans for you, and his promises don't have expiration dates on them. And this is what we believe. Here on this earth, when we carry the presence of God, there will be evidence of his existence through the creation of your life. You know, there's that saying that people will read your life more than they'll ever read the Bible because they'll notice oh, something, there's something about her. No, there's something different about him. You don't have to wear a shirt that says, need prayer, ask me how. You don't have to wear a shirt that says, catch up with Jesus. I'm like, does that say catch up? Oh, that's creative. I see what that, okay, that's cool. Spirit instead of Sprite. <laughs> I can go on, trust me, I know lots of them. Okay. He shaped and molded us like a potter with, with clay. But this is really interesting. He spoke everything else into existence. He said, let there be light. Okay, we know this. He told the stars where to go. He told the seas where to have their limits so that the water doesn't overtake the earth. He spoke everything into existence except us. He shaped and molded us. He took us up from out of the dirt and breathe life into it, took a rib from a man named Adam and created Eve. He took his time on you. Close your eyes and just say it till you believe it. Say, he took his time on me. He took his time on us. Ephesians 2.10 in the Amplified, I referenced it briefly a moment ago, but it says this, for we are his workmanship. Watch this. His own masterwork, a uh, work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking the paths for which he set, so that we would walk in them, living our best life, living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us. Because again, when we walk with the Lord, there will be some sort of evidence. Psalms 139, verse 14 through 17 says, thank you. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. I love this. Every moment was laid out. Before a single day had passed, how precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. Y'all, even before the universe was created, God had you in mind. He planned out your life for his purposes. And these purposes, they extend far beyond the years that we have on this earth because the Bible re references this life we live as a vapor. That we're here today and we're gone tomorrow because here's the truth. You were made, we were made to live forever, to be eternally with him in heaven. That's why we believe at Hope City that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We're not a universalistic church that believes that all gods lead back to one God. We believe Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says it this way. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. There is a very real place called heaven and a very real place called hell. You were made to last forever, and we have a choice we have a choice to be eternally with him in heaven. So God has this incredible plan for our lives. And I've said this off and on the past couple of years, that he has the ability to light up our path and show us the way to go. And we've, we've said this before, but if you ever want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> like, God, I like that plan, but let me tell you what I've got planned. And God's like, oh, okay. Psalms 119, 105 says this, by your words, I can see where I'm going. 
They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself, and I'll never turn back. Come on, say it out loud. I'll never turn back. I never turn back. Now, I'm going to do a fun little illustration, a little silly, but you're going to remember it. Can everybody look over your left shoulder as far as you can? Come on. Oof, we need some chiropractic adjustments. Oh, man. <laughs> left shoulder. Just do it, do it real quick. Do it quick. All right, now look over your right shoulder as far as you can. Beautiful, beautiful. Now look at me. That's the last time you're ever going to look back at the way things used to be from today on. I'm, I told you it was going to be cheesy, but you're going to remember it. Because where God is about to take you and the deposit he's about to make... Come on, we're growing from glory to glory. It's only getting better. But it's a choice. It's a choice to follow the steps that God has for you. This is where free will comes into play. Free will gives us this incredible opportunity to either surrender our own ambitions, ambitions, and allow God to unlock his purpose and his plan for our lives, or... It gives us the opportunity to say, no, no, God, I'll go my own way. I don't need you. You do you, I'll do me. <laughs> last night, this is ridiculous, but last night I was tucking in our kids and we, we have like a regimen. We turn on worship music in the house and Jack and I go to each kid's room. We have four of them. Four no more, it rhymes, amen. So <laughs> tucking in Fox, man, we pray over him and then we go into Daphne's room. Well, Daphne's having a conversation with our older brother, Brecken, who just turned 15 on New Year's Eve. And she's like, hey, Breck, so and she calls him Bubby. Bubby, so talk, talk to me about college. She's seven. Talk to me about college. And he's like, well, what do you want to know? And she's like, well, why do you got to go to college? And he said, well, college is kind of that point in your life where it shows the world I'm growing up. And she's, as he's telling her, this is what I'm watching it, as he's telling her, and he's feeling pretty good, like, hey, that was pretty good. She goes, okay, well, you do you. Just walks away. I'm like, where did you get that? Okay, you do you. Okay. But the truth is, when you do you, there's also evidence of that. There's also evidence that looks different than the nine fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of you doing you and choosing your own path looks like pride. Ooh, looks like arrogance. Looks like unhealthy ambition. Looks like selfishness. Looks like reckless choices. Somebody might want to put ratchet. Amen. Just put it down there. It looks messy. You got some evidence. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that in any of the other services. That was for somebody. Okay. <laughs> Listen, it's 1230. Y'all are like, I slept in. I was out late last night. <laughs> I was out there. I tried my own way, and I'm telling you, God's way is so much better. Come on, somebody say amen if you receive that. It's so much better. Now, I had a lot of ideas growing up. I did. I had dreams and goals and ambitions. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to have those, and a lot of those are downloaded from God, deposited from God to you and through you, and at the right appointed time, he unlocks it. But I remember going to my mom, and I said, hey, I think I know what God wants me to do, and she's like, what? I said, I think I want to be a model, and she was like, oh, Oh, you should have a bowl of cereal instead. Like just, just like, oh, I don't know how to break it to him because you, know, you have to be good looking. So that didn't work out. So I skipped that. Okay, I skipped that. And then I was like, I could be a game show host. Like how many of y'all still watch like Price is Right, Wheel of Fortune and stuff like that? Anybody else? Okay, nine people. Well, my family does. I don't know why. But anyways, I was like, what's behind door number six, Bob? Like I could do it. I felt like I could do it. It didn't work out. So then I was, I was determined. I mean, I'm really intentionally figuring out how I could be an illusionist. But then there was one piece about illusionists that I could never get down. And it was their selling of the moment. And I didn't understand it, but they would be like, okay, well, is this your knife? And I'm like, why are they so out of breath? They're like, is this your card? Is this it? I'm like, I can't do this. It just didn't seem genuine. And I tried to go my own way. I tried to go my own path. But what ended up happening was I ended up drifting wherever the wind took me. 
So I did music for a long time. For those of you who don't know, I did music for a long time, traveled and play multiple instruments. And so we ended up taking Jackie and I to Nashville and I did a showcase at the same time that this artist named Matt Carney. So he was offered a record deal. I was offered this deal. And we we're like, we're moving to Nashville, like Cool Springs Boulevard. Like this is going to be it. I'm going to write songs. And we felt very convicted from the Holy Spirit. You can go this path, but this isn't my, my path for you. It's good, but it's not me. It's good, but it's not God. And I remember talking to Jackie, and she was like, babe, I, I know this is amazing, but I feel like we need to say no, because it felt like we were just, wherever the wind blew, we were drifting. It was when we really got intentional about spending time in the presence of God and saying, God, instead of all these rabbit trails, mostly distractions that seem to be taking me all these different paths, I want to encounter your presence at a at a level where I hear your still small voice and I know this door is opening for you, that door needs to close, this relationship's supposed to be in your life, this relationship's not. So much of the time we were wasting time. We were wasting time because a lot of times what ends up happening is we start in our humanity, and I'll, I'll, I'll pull myself in there with you. We start in our humanity at the wrong starting point. What is that, Pastor Daniel? We start with ourselves. We start where we're like, God, let me tell you my dreams. Let me tell you my plans. Let me tell you my ambitions, my future. And we end up spending time in this me, myself, and I sort of mentality instead of focusing on God, what do you have for me? Because when we focus on ourselves first, we never fully understand or grasp his purposes for our life. Look what the Bible says in Job 12, 10. It's on the screens. For the life of every living thing is, is in his hands and the breath of every human being. So goals, dreams, ambitions are great, but it's really not about us. Look at the person next to you and say, it's not about you. Look at your second choice and say, it's not about you. No, it's about him. It's about him unlocking his purpose for your life. So it has to begin with God first, the creator, the one who has the reasons, <laughs> the reason that he created you because there's an assignment. You were made by God, for God, and until we fully understand that, life will never fully make sense. It's only by God and in his presence that we discover our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and even our destiny. This is why every week our prayer is that we would grow, that we would grow every single day, and it doesn't have to be giant faith step leaps. It could just be a little bit of mustard seed faith, but at least we're growing. We're going to grow every day. We've been talking a lot about purpose today, speaking of evidence, knowing God and finding freedom and discovering his purpose. I love the word purpose and the definition of it. It's this right here, the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. So number one, if you're taking down notes, and you can take a picture of it for the sake of not having to write it down. Number one, we were created to walk in purpose. We are created to walk in purpose. And again, God's equipped each and every one of us with specific gifts and talents, and it's a choice to walk it out. Walk it out and walk out the purpose and the gifts that he's given to you. I said this, I don't know when it was, maybe a month or two ago. It's interesting, though, how we withhold our gifts. Like, well, I'm just, I don't know why Kim up here singing can't hear me in the crowd. If she saw my gift, she would ask me to be on the Hope City worship team. <laughs> or we withhold our gifts because, now let me just be really, really, really sensitive here for a minute. We withhold our gifts because maybe you're, you're here at Hope City and you have church hurt from previous times where your gifts felt exploited and used and abused a little bit where they only saw your gifts in the moment they didn't need your gifts anymore. It was like, no, see, I don't even know your name. That's not the way we operate here. Because here's the thing about our gifts, and maybe you have had this misunderstanding, and it's okay, because I did for a long time. The problem with withholding your gifts is you think those gifts belong to you. But the gifts and calling of God are not only irrevocable, but they're from God to you and through you. I don't know who this is for, but it's time to take it back off the shelf and get involved, get plugged in. Use your gifts again. Elbow the person next to you and say, 
I felt strong about that. Come on. I felt strong about that. I'm telling you, there are things that God wants to unlock in you, and Hope City is a church where purpose comes alive, where you can use your gifts and your call and being as sensitive as I can for your, your past frustrations or your past times, I, I, I'm praying that this experience here will be brand new and fresh, and there'll be a fresh wind behind your sail. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and 11 says, God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Now, let me give you a little insight. I don't ever fully get to unpack this. There's a, one of our board members talks about how not everybody gets to see how the sausage is made. Like, <laughs> like you go to the restaurants, probably most of us wouldn't eat at those restaurants if you saw some of the restaurant's conditions. Amen. <laughs> Excuse me, but before I come out to preach, every service, every service, I walk up these steps. So Jackie and I sit on the front row. You can see us worshiping. Then we walk back here. And then after the service, you can see us in the lobby because I'm not a ready room preacher. I don't like hiding and being hidden and being away from all y'all. I love, I love, I want to be around y'all. Give me, listen, I love the energy. I want to know your name. We want to be around you. That's why we go out to the lobby. Okay, so every, every week I come back here and as I'm walking up the steps, I do this every week. I close my eyes and I say, God, Paul said it's not with the enticing words of man's wisdom or perfect oratory delivery, but it's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. The God you anointed the donkey and you anointed Paul. I'm probably closer to the donkey. <laughs> so God, I pray that you use my words today to glorify you. Because y'all, without his anointing, this is just noise. Without his presence and the tangible fruit of his spirit in the atmosphere, then Hope City Worship playing music is just karaoke. But when his presence is in the room and the anointing of God begins to move, tangible response from the spirit of God begins to transform and restore and deliver. And that's where we experience breakthrough. That's where a year from now you're like, oh, no, no, listen, I was in the room. I remember I had a tumor and it disappeared. Oh, no, no, I was in the room. I remember I walked in with heartbreak and walked out like I was new. No, I walked in and everything seemed to be falling apart. But by the time I left, everything was falling into place. Come on, somebody. We're talking about the Spirit of God. So it says this. If you have the gift of speaking, then use it. Allow God to speak through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? That should be a resounding yes. We should all answer that one. Do we have the gift of helping others? And you're like, no, nah, I don't really like that. No, we all. <laughs> That's not for me. <laughs> like, no, we should all be helping others. It says this, then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Say this last part with me. Amen. Amen. So we were all created and designed to walk in purpose I love the definition of the word design. We looked at purpose. This is what design means. To create, to fashion, execute, or construct according to plan. There is purpose in the design of each and every one of our lives. The design of this chair is evident. We know what it is. We, everybody, what is this? This isn't a trick question. What is this? The purpose is in its design. So what is the purpose of a chair? Come on, shout it out. I love this. You're like, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. The purpose of a chair is to, to sit in it. Now, if I use this chair according to the purpose and the design of this chair, y'all, this chair can last for a long time. Like, I can pass this chair on. I can say to Fox, this, I can be 87 years old, like, listen to me, brother. <laughs> I remember that chair. Now I could pass this chair on. It could be a generational blessing. Some of y'all are like, that's a $19 Ikea chair. Just lock in, okay? Just take it easy. <laughs> but anytime I use this chair outside of what it was designed for, I could use this chair to, you know, Jackie's like, hey, go grab the hammer. We got to nail this nail into this board. I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to do that, but I'll use the leg of the chair because it's sturdy enough to just, you know, I could just nail the... The nail into the, but again, what's the purpose of a chair? 
right, right, right. So then she's like, hey, babe, you're tall, but I can't reach to the very tippity top, so can you do me a favor? Can you reach up there? And I'm like, well, I don't have a little step stool. I'll use the chair. Great. So I get all the way up on this thing, and I'm up there, and I'm trying to reach for it, and then the kids are like, hey, Dad, can you, can you put the, the star on top of the tree? I'm like, I'm on the chair. No problem. And I'm using the chair outside of the design of the chair, because what's the purpose of the chair? It's to sit in it. So then it's sitting off to the side, and the kids are like, Dad, let's play a game. And I'm like, what do y'all want to play? And they're like, musical chairs. I'm like, I've got a chair. And so we're playing, and I'm like, nope, you're not going to win. Nope, you're not going to do this. And then I'm like, boom, and I'm falling on the chair, and I'm using this chair outside of the design of the chair. What's the purpose of the chair? Anytime I use this chair outside of what it was designed for, I'm robbing it of its integrity it's character, yeah. and it's longevity. Yeah. Wow. Now, now, y'all are like, that's good for the chair. Let me tie it in to the parallel of life. Anytime we don't walk out the assignment and the call of God on our lives, and we go our own way, and we say, God, you do you, and I'll do me, and we try to figure out this crazy life in our own strength, it messes with and robs us of our integrity, our character, and our longevity, because God has a mission, come on somebody, and skills, and a purpose, and the design, the purpose of God is seen in our design. There's something greater. There's something about her life. There's something, and you never have to have a microphone or a stage to be a person of influence. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be carrying the good news, we're supposed to go into all the world. Some are like, well, I'm not going to the third world country for nobody. How about talking to your coworker? How about talking to your neighbor? How about being a blessing to the barista? How about talking to your waiter or waitress and not treating them like less than? How about being kind to the daycare workers? You're like, you don't know them. Just follow along. Okay, amen. No, no, but the truth is your purpose is seen in your design. But every time again, we go outside of the assignment. The purpose and the design that God has, it messes with our longevity. When we walk in the purpose that God has for us, not only does he mark us with his presence and there's evidence that we walk with him, but it also leaves a mark on this earth. Wave at me if you want to make a difference. Come on, wave at me if you want to make a legacy difference in your family. And come on, I love that. Like, you want to make a difference on this earth. And here at Hope City, we're passionate. As a church, and I don't mean the four walls, I mean the body of Christ. We're passionate about leaving a mark in our city, our nation, and the world. That's why we're a church from neighborhoods to nations. So here's a director from the word. This is in red letters. Jesus himself speaks these words. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So that part's a little like, okay, Jesus, it's a little bit of a riddle. Like, okay, I'm salty, what's that mean? Salt is, maybe you've heard me preach this before, salt's distinctive. So if uh, we're at a restaurant or you're making food at home and you put too much salt, you know it. Why? Because it's distinctive. Ooh, I added too much salt. But the same is true if you don't have enough salt. I need to get some, somebody pass me the salt. Why? Because again, salt is distinctive. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, you were never called to blend in. You were never called to just be in the, you were never called to just live a camouflage life. Never making a difference, never really doing anything. No, baby, you were called to stand out. You were called to be distinctive. You were called to stand out in a crowd and when everybody else is going this way, you're like, hey, you know what? My integrity and my character is not gonna allow me to joke like that. It's not gonna allow me to play around like that. I'm not gonna do that anymore because I walk with Jesus, you're the salt of the earth. Now, the second half of this verse is a lot more self-explanatory. You are the light of the world. Come on, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. Why? Because it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, when you walk with the Lord there will be light. There will be influence. There will be some sort of evidence. All right, the last one. All right, a second one right here. Number two, write this one down. Number two, we were created, I love this, 
to be multiplied. Now, before you freak out, you're like, we're not having any more kids. I'm skipping this one. (laughs) Now, this is what legacy looks like to Jackie and I. Because here's the truth, and I believe this wholeheartedly. There are certain things we are called to do. But I also know there's a lid on our life. There's a certain level of influence that God is going to trust us with. So this is our prayer, that the lid and the ceiling on Jackie and I's life is the foundation and the floor for our kids' lives. It's a foundation for them to build upon. So everything that the Holy Spirit deposits and downloads to her and I, we're downloading it into them. So when the Spirit of God speaks or there's a blessing or something happens in our life or we're walking through a storm, we pull specifically our older kids in on it because we want them to grow in the things of God because we want them to ultimately fulfill their assignment and their call and be able to say, yeah, my mom and dad built a great platform and a great foundation for us to build upon, not even realizing was actually our ceiling. So as God trusts us with more, he's gonna, I believe, trust them with even more. This is a loaded statement, but every action you make today resonates throughout eternity. Your existence changes history. The ripple effect of your life's decisions impact your eternity. Your imprint transcends your physical presence. A life that's multiplied continues on for generations to come. The Bible says in Colossians 3, verse 17, Whatever you do or say, you should do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This verse became so real to me. About a year and some change ago, I went to a home-going service for a dear friend of mine's father. And I'd only met the man once, but man, there was no sorrow, there was no sadness. It was a celebration of the impact, the legacy And a man who lived out his life representing Jesus, he lived a life that was multiplied. There were three things he was passionate about, and if you met him, everybody knew that he was passionate about God, he loved his wife and his kids, and he loved people. And he made everybody feel valuable, he made everybody feel welcome, he would look you in the eyes and take time with you. From gas station attendants to baristas to waitresses, Two employees, he made a massive, long-lasting deposit and impact in their life. And even all this time later, people are still telling stories about him. I want to live a life that's marked by his presence. I want to live a life that people say that man was authentic, that man was transparent. Because the truth is, y'all, we have a lot of highlight reels, but we don't have a lot of legacies. Guess what? I said it earlier. You have permission to be the first in your bloodline to leave a legacy. Come on, if you, if you receive that, say, I receive it. All right, bringing this in for a landing in just a moment. My wife reads these stories to our kids, and they're about missionaries, people that are living a life that's multiplied, people that are impacting people in third world countries. They're going into bushes, into, into to remote areas, and they're reaching people far from God and taking the gospel She tells these stories about heroes in the faith. These people don't have massive TikTok followers. They don't have millions of views on YouTube. They don't have a huge Instagram following. They're not even on MySpace. Nobody is. But (laughs) no, these people are people that live a multiplied life. They walk in their design purpose from God, and they're expanding and reaching people for the kingdom. What kind of difference are we making I know the difference we want to make as a church, but what kind of difference is your life making? Let me ask this loaded question. Is it impacting at least one? Because a life multiplied is to be repeated several times over and over. It fires me up because I know there is gifting and strength and purpose that hasn't even come alive yet in the room. There are people that are just waiting for the opportunity to jump and say yes, but maybe there's been a lid on your life. Maybe you have not been living in a way that the evidence of Christ has been reflective in your life, but maybe it's the other evidence we talked about, that free will choices. We believe today we're gonna be able to align our lives with the Lord. A life that's multiplied, again, is a life that makes a difference. Here's the last takeaway. You can write this down and take a picture. Number three, we were created, I love this, to demonstrate his power. We were created 
to demonstrate his power. The purpose of your existence is the passing on of his power. Your impact is dependent upon his involvement in your life. And the purpose of your life is seen through the lens of his power. Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17. We don't go to Zephaniah very often. If y'all are, if there's somebody trying to find it, figure out a name, like we're currently pregnant, how about Zephaniah? <laughs> a little Zephy, amen. Zephaniah chapter three, I don't know why it's so funny to me. Oh, Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17 says, the Lord your God is with you. His power gives you victory. His power. His power. Come on, somebody say his power. His power, his power gives you victory. The Lord will take delight in you. And in his love, he will give you new life. He will sing and be joyful over you. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power from him that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Come on, say it with me. Amen. Amen. So again, we were created to demonstrate his power. I'm audacious enough to believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Come on, we have the ability to prophesy in his name. We have the ability to reach into dark places where people have written people groups off in certain parts of our city, nation, and the world, and we say, if not us, then who? No, we'll go ahead and say yes, God, send us. Because we're audacious enough to believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the direct source that we have, which is Jesus, the direct access we have to the Holy Spirit and the help of our Father, it's unlimited what God can do through a group of unified believers who will access his power. So drawing this to a close, a lot of times, maybe because of condemnation or shame or brokenness, we're not accessing the full access to the power of God that we have access to. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. The evidence, yeah, my evidence is, is messy. It's a miracle. I'm even in the room. And you know what? I just want to say thank you. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for being here today. I said it earlier. You're not so fragile. You're not so broken that he can't unlock destiny in you. You can carry the evidence of his presence. Uh, so we like to camp. I say that very, very carefully because I like to glamp. I need Wi-Fi and air conditioning, amen. Don't let the beard fool you, come on. So we have a camper and we like to go with the kids and anytime we pull into an RV park and I back my truck in and I back the camper up, my kids jump out and we grab the cable and there's a box, there's a power box. And if you don't know it, you think you just plug it in and all is well, but no, when you flip open that little lid, there's three options. There's a 50 amp. How many of y'all camp? You like a little bit, you RV a little bit. How many of y'all like, no way, no thanks. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, great. There's a 50 amp plug. When I plug that in, the entire camper runs like a house. Air conditioning, TV, the fridge works, everything works. I mean, everything works like a full functioning home. It's great, 50 amp, great. The 30 amp, less power. Uh, the air conditioning can be spotty, may not even be able to run it. The fridge works, that's great. We've got power, but there's definitely some limited power. It's not what I signed up for. And then there's the 110. It's a standard plug at your house, and that only runs the fridge. That triggers a few lights, and then we can plug a cell phone in enough to get the power back on to say, hey, can somebody come pick me up? I hate this. Like, that's pretty much it. But my kids will ask, why don't you plug into the 30, or why don't you plug into the other one? Because we have access to full power. But the problem is when you allow the enemy to lie to you, to tell you you're disqualified, to tell you you're too blemished, broken, and fragile to experience his power, today I want to remind you, you have access to the full power of Jesus. And our audacious faith is to have 50 amp faith. And we're gonna plug into the source that can move the heart of God in a city that's far from God. So we're gonna plug back in. We're gonna plug back into the source during this evidence series so that each and every one of us when we walk into a room, there will be some sort of, say it out loud, evidence. Will you close your eyes just for a moment? God, today, here's my prayer. There's a lot of people, a lot of family, amazing, amazing people, God, that come from all walks of life. Some are on top of the mountain right now. Some are in the lowest valley they've ever been. 
Some of them feel like they have arrived and figured things out, and some feel so frustrated and so hurt. They barely are making it through the day. Here's my prayer. My prayer is that the power of your spirit would begin to overshadow every single one of us, that you would heal hearts, that you would draw us closer. Romans chapter two, verse four, you would draw us in. It's your goodness and it's your love. Now, it is our choice to connect and align our hearts to the source of all power, and that's you, God. We want to walk out our purpose because you designed and created us to. We want to live a life that's multiplied because you designed and created us to. And we want to live a life that demonstrates your power, where we walk in the confidence and the boldness of your presence, knowing, God, that we are standing in your faithfulness every single day day. God, I pray today that you would overshadow us. If you want to be closer to his heart, maybe today you would say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I have not been carrying the presence of God. I, the evidence of my walk with him has been very, very faint. Honestly, the presence of my choices look more like the evidence. And today I want to align my heart to the heart of God so that I can grow and get stronger. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? I want God to meet me today so that I can start living my life in such a way that the evidence of his power and his spirit, his presence overflows in my life. Thank you for your transparency. I see you. Probably 80 of our friends say, hey, today's the day. Beautiful. You can put your hands down. All right, so this is the next invitations. I've got two. The first is this, Pastor Daniel, the reason I don't have the evidence of God's power in my life is because I don't know him. Here's what we believe at Hope City. We believe Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. It's very clear when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. That's where the evidence begins to unlock in your life because he's going to write victory in your story. It says he throws your sins as far from the east as the west never to throw them in your face again. All condemnation, all shame, all sin eradicated and fixed, healed, set free and delivered. But maybe you're the second choice and you're like, Pastor Daniel, I've given my life to the Lord in the past, but I have no evidence of his power in my life because I've gotten caught up in the prodigal life. Today's the day I want to come back. I want to come back to his heart. I've said this for quite a while, but Jesus is just one mention of his name away from being right there again as your very present help in time of need. I'm gonna count to three. Nobody's gonna embarrass you. We're gonna start walking out the evidence of our relationship with God. One, I wanna give my life to God. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. I wanna make things right with Jesus today. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over. I see you. My gosh. There's so many hands. Just leave them up for a minute. I see you. I see you and you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see all of you and over here and here and here and all in the back. I see everybody over here. I see you guys. I see you. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise? Amazing. Wow. Probably 35 or 40 hands say you're talking about me. You can put your hands down. We're all going to pray. My friend, Pastor Andy, our major life events pastor, along with his wife, Pastor Cindy, he says something. I love it. He said, maybe you didn't feel comfortable lifting up your hand. God didn't need to see your hand. He saw your heart. So we're all going to pray. And if you're watching online, maybe you stumbled upon this replay and you're like, Pastor Tango, I needed this moment. Amazing. You can say yes to Jesus. Say yes. And our team will help you right there. Come on. Can every one of us pray? And then I'm going to speak a blessing over you. And we're going to be dismissed. We're going to come back for game day next week. Let me ask this poll real quick. How many of y'all are going for the 49ers? How many of y'all are going for the Chiefs? How many of y'all are only going to watch the commercials? All right, that's enough. All right, let's go back, 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 back. Pulling back to spiritual. Everybody pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, it's me. Here's all my sin. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my shame. Here's all my brokenness. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I repent for all of my issues. From this moment on, I'm choosing to live for you. Jesus, thank you for exchanging your life for mine so that I can live a life of hope and I can live a life of freedom. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord in Jesus' name. Let's go, Hope City. Can we give God praise?